Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Manuela Basomi with us. Manuela, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Jack. Even better, thank you. But that's okay. That's not really important. <laughs> very good. So to give the, this podcast, uh, our listeners, a bit of context of the conversation, can you introduce who you are uh, and what you do? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, my name is Manuela. I'm a physiotherapist by background. I'm from Chile. And um, I moved to Australia in early 2017 to do my PhD in um, the University of Queensland, where I'm currently working. And my PhD was about... Um, understanding the methods that we can use to measure um, the in vivo, the in vivo, um, the um, tissue, oh my goodness, sorry. That's so right. the, <laughs> the in vivo um, measures that we can use to estimate the um, physical capacities or the um, physical properties of, of tissues, so such as the tibial band, and also um, providing recommendation, consensus-based recommendations on the use of electromyography or CD or e EMG through the um, Consensus for Experimental Design in Electromyography or CD project, which I'm currently coordinating as well. Hmm. So at the moment, I work as a research fellow at UQ um, and I'm coordinating a big project um, in a hedge funded project, looking at um, understanding the risk factors for low back pain flares. So we're using a range of different methods to um, understand how pain fluctuates in people with low back pain in their real world. So um, that's pretty much what I'm doing in terms of research. And also I'm very passionate about running and running injuries. So I also lead a group of clinicians and researchers um, back in Chile that basically um, contribute to understanding of, of of how to manage and prevent running injuries. Very cool. C can you actually elaborate a little bit more of what your PhD was on? Because we hear about things like EMG a lot within the re physiotherapy research. Yep. And I feel like there seems to be a lot of confusion about what EMG is and what it tells us. Because from my understanding of, e of EMG, um, it can obviously give us certain messages. But I was, I was interested to hear a bit more about your thoughts on it in general, and particularly you'd mentioned about measuring physical properties and can does EMG give us indications of physical properties or is it more just like the the neural activity yeah so when I when I say physical properties I meant more like um surrogate measures of stiffness using shear wave elastography for ah, example yes. ultrasound based measures but particularly for EMG um in like very simple terms because it's not a simple tool um it basically measures the electrical activity from your muscles so it's a neuromuscular um, measure and what we did um, in my PhD and what we're actually currently doing at the moment is trying to because there's so much information about there about like EMG how to do it how not to do it like what sort of you know how to place electrodes how to normalize you amplitude like it's just so much there that is very hard to follow um, like proper recommendations or like what what sort of like um, decisions you should you should make when you're planning for example an experiment so um, the problem is that if you don't really design your experiment to answer your research question you might actually get results that are not appropriate and you're actually misleading or misinterpreting the results and therefore like for example the clinical recommendations so a lot of the exercise based um, studies that are based on, e on EMG might be flawed because if you didn't apply the right method, for example, to normalize the amplitude of the EMG signal, um, you cannot actually interpret the signal in that right way. So that's why we developed this CD project, which is the Consensus for Experimental Design in Electromyography, which is an international initiative, which aims to guide the decision-making process in the um, analysis, interpretation, and um, planning of, of EMG studies. So, so far we have published um, six, decision-making matrices with different topics that are relevant for EMG. So for example, within my PhD, we published the electrode selection, how, how to select your electrodes for the best um, application for a specific experimental context, and also recommendations around how to normalize the, the amplitude of the EMG signal. So it really depends like what you want to achieve, how, to, how do you manage or, or um, 
analyze your your EMG signals in data. And we also published all the all the four or five like terminology, high density surface EMG, single motor unit a checklist, like a bunch of other things that are relevant for EMG. Okay. What can EMG actually tell us? Yeah, uh, so good question. So um, it really depends. <laughs> I say it depends because it, it it depends on how you apply it and and when you use it. But in general terms, it tells you the. Um, whether a muscle is actually firing or not, right? Like it's the electrical activity. So you can interpret in simple terms the the amount of 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 the activity that you're measuring with all the limitations that that will have. Like you know, like depending on where you place the electrode, which sort of uh, portion of the muscle you're measuring, etc. Um, it can also tell you when a muscle is on or off, and it can also tell you about the pattern of, of activity, right? So it's, it's uh, for example, in a dynamic task like running, um, you can see like a muscle is on and off and, and, and how the pattern um, changes throughout the task. It might also give you, um, we, we could also measure th more complex things like synergies, which is um, a combination of, of muscles that work together to achieve one task or one movement. That's a bit more complex. Um, we also use CMG to understand single motor unit activity. So we, for that, we use other methods like high density surface EMG or fine wear um, EMG to actually go into the motor unit. So firing rate, so when a muscle is firing or the recruitment of, of, of the recruitment of a motor unit. Um, so you can get all sort of different neuromuscular features of, of your musculoskeletal system using this technique. It can definitely not tell you it wouldn't really um, tell you anything about how much force an individual is is doing. You can estimate the change in force from a the change in amplitude of a signal. But the biggest, I think, mistake that we see, at least in the sports science um, field, is that we try to estimate or we try to interpret EMG amplitude as a surrogate measure of force, and actually we cannot do that. Mm, yeah. So um, that's, I guess, the biggest issue. Yeah, I think that's really important to emphasize because I think a lot of people will look at a study, see that this particular exercise increases EMG activity of a particular muscle and associate that with an increase in the mechanical force being exposed at the tissue level. But the problem with that is, particularly from an exercise prescription standpoint, is if that's not the case, are you applying enough mechanical tension to create adaptations that you desire? Yeah, yeah, that's that's. Yeah, that's the, the biggest, I think, problem. Mm. The other question I have to you about EMG is, is there such a thing as a normal EMG pattern? Because I think of, like, and obviously you work at the University of Queensland, you've done a lot of work with Paul Hodges and obviously mm. him along with, like, Gwen Jarl, particularly in the 90s, 2000s, did a lot of work of looking at changes in EMG behaviour in people with, mm. say, chronic back pain or neck pain. But it's something that I've often thought about of, is there such a thing as normal, so to speak? Because I think about, say, and running is a good task or lifting. There's a lot of different variables to consider about how I lift versus, say, you. And that's going to be reflective, I would have thought, in the, the neural signature as well. Absolutely. And I think there's some very nice work done by Francois Hook um, from Nantes University. Um, they did, I think they measured... Could be wrong but about like 80 uh people and they had them either cycling or running and they they repeated the measurements i think said like two or one or two weeks later and what they found was that particip participants have like a, a very unique signature of movement so the variability between participants was massive mm -hmm. but within the person you have a unique signature. So if you're not in pain, for example, um, and you don't change your behavior, the way that you move actually should match, like, you know, if you measure the same movement um, over time. So that that's pretty interesting because that tells you that you could potentially identify someone based on their own signature of movement. And we, we could um, think that, of course, like pain or any other um, condition might change your own signature. But if you compare between individuals, it's, it's it's really tricky. That's mm -hmm. why we need like lots of people to average the data and actually see if if there are differences in in between groups of 
participants, yeah. With, with that in mind, can you is it possible to use that signature and, and track that across that same person in a similar task to get an identification of, say, fatigue patterns and what actually happens with that individual? You know, something that I uh, we've been talking about a lot is more in a global sense, this idea of central nervous system fatigue. And I think it's not well defined and a lot of people aren't potentially using you know, measures like this as some sort of correlate because to me, the actual you know, neurological activity that's happening at the tissue level is probably a, a good marker to know, are they actually fatigued from a you know, nervous system point of view? Um, is this something that's possible that you could kind of track within that individual and say, okay, your signature looks similar, but when we know you get fatigued, this is the pattern or this is the ampl amplitude that changes or am, am I um, extrapolating too much there? Um, I think, well, fatigue is a, is a big beast and I, I haven't done much work in fatigue. Like I think it's just such a big thing. Like, mm. and we don't really, as you said, like we don't really understand what's the mechanism behind. We know like a couple of things that could be affecting like central and peripheral mechanisms. Um, there's some work done by Eduardo Martinez on this um, uh, from the University of Birmingham in, in the UK. And they did like motor unit um, um, analysis and they tracked really had like a, a strengthening program mm. over time. And you could, you can actually see improvements um, in motor unit recruitment, anti recruitment, and firing patterns, or so firing rate um, with training, which is pretty cool. I think that was a, the very first time that someone did that in terms of like a neuromuscular, like a like a better proxy of what's happening with your neuromuscular system in terms of strengthening adaptations, right? Um, in terms of fatigue, um, there are protocols that you can investigate. And, it, and it, it, the problem with fatigue is just it changes your EMG signal mm. and, okay. in, a, in a way that you, it's hard to actually interpret it. So you is, don't is know. A, mm, sorry to interrupt, but is that then, therefore then a correlate that someone is fatiguing because their, as you said, their signature seems to be similar? Um, but once they do reach, a, say, a, maybe a certain threshold of fatigue, then all of a sudden it doesn't look like their normal signature. Would that be, again, am I oversimplifying that? But is that possible that you kind of say, okay, your normal signal looks like this, and now all of a sudden it doesn't look like that, potentially one of the mechanisms causing that is a fatigue uh, yeah. input? Potentially, yes, we, we could we could say that, but it's it's a really hard thing to to study, and I don't think we have all the answers yet. Yeah, And that seems to be the thing that, comes across from my understanding of looking at this topic of motor control or sensory motor control and EMG activities. EMG gives us a, a proxy about what's happening in terms of the neural activity, but it doesn't necessarily give us any indications of what is causing changes in it because, as you mentioned, then fatigue is one. I know there's been some research published looking at changes, say, in tendon stiffness that influences EMG behaviour. I know, obviously, Paul Hodges has been doing a lot of work of you know, the animal models are looking at changes in the, uh, in the erector spiny following like a disc lesion where you see an increase in connective tissue around the muscle spindles, which is obviously going to influence the neuromuscular sig signature as well. So it seems that I, I get the impression that EMG we have to look at as giving us indication of seeing changes in the motor control or sensory motor patterns, but may not necessarily give us indication of what's particular variable of factors causing that change well it's just one piece of the, the whole puzzle right like mm. um um and, and it's, as i said like it's so hard to really to interpret emg over time there's so many things that could go wrong so um i don't think at least i haven't seen a study that has looked at like all the different you know measures or uh, factors that could contribute to this change that you're talking about so we're talking about them like they're like muscle like even within the muscle so you have the neuromuscular but then the muscle morphology that sort of thing like um it's it, we're not a 2d um system it's a 3d system so that's also yes. affecting the the capacity to produce um force tendon it's a whole beast um within the muscle muscle spindles and all that fascia is another beast that, so i don't think we, we we have like the answer to that but definitely agree that emg is just a way of of like a um looking at your neuromuscular um control and system um and you, we just need to be mindful of like we, we, 
when we interpret that data, um, it, we just need to be cautious and, and not over interpret. Yeah. Okay, sorry, can, can I ask, you mentioned there the idea of a, you know, much more of a 3D model. Can, can you explore that a little bit? Because it's something that has caught our attention um, over the last, you know, little period. And it's something that I think is very hard for people to conceptualize because we see anatomy and even functional anatomy is very much being this 2D structure. Um, but it's not really what is going on. It is a little bit more complex than that. Um, and I know that's a very big question, but if possible, can you give us a little bit of an idea of what you're starting to see in, in how this does adapt um, and, and function in a more of a 3D pattern? Yeah, so again, like this is not my area of work, but <clears throat> people that I know that I've been working on, there's a PhD student here um, and also a researcher from Brussels there been looking at um, <clears throat> the first thing is like there is a huge variability between individuals so that's the first thing like we we just need to first acknowledge that the shape of of a muscle is will differ between people um, and second whether you know when you contract um, like the the muscle fibers will change depending on on the shape right and in some portions of the muscle you would have like a, a different change in 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 the 3d um, um behavior right that will be different so it's it's quite complex in terms of like when you when you look at the studies and we we interpret muscle force for example from one muscle fiber um it's really tricky because the muscle is not that right and and mm. there's some very interesting work um done by Jiron um ales from brussels that they actually um measure this in in people like between legs and and they showed that like the the muscle fiber length is different when you look at different portions of the muscle the 3d shape is also different like there's so many factors that are affecting this um so i think when we think of like well like in a clinical or um application like as a physio I, i've always been um encouraging people to if you're going to train a muscle just try to do it like in different for example uh, range of motion so like think of like a muscle uh, say yeah contracting in a 3d way so if you if you move in one direction that will affect like you know the other structures and so you just need to train yourself i you know thinking of a 3d um system yeah, yeah we... that makes sense well, I was actually Sorry. just going to say too, because like, and you've mentioned a couple of other topics that we need to touch on. One of them being fascia, mm -hmm. and uh, talking about the dynamic nature of muscle. I think of things like uh, muscle architecture. You know, and there's all these studies that are looking like a two D ultrasound of here's the the fascicle length. Yet, if you look at some of the research, I know the surname of the authors is Roberts and Azizi and Eng of all the dynamic uh, muscle architecture work that depending on the type of contraction, you can actually see changes within the fascial sheets that influence then the angle, of the fascicles to ultimately put them in a position where they are optimized to produce either really high force or really high velocity type contractions. And I think that to your point, it's, it's something that when you start to look at the behavior of the neuromuscular system, it becomes so complex that I think the best thing that you can do clinically is think about, what kind of activity do I need this person to do? And how can mm -hmm. I replicate that in some type of rehabilitation setting? When you think about the you know, direction of, or magnitude of the force or the, the rate of force development that's required. Do you think that's a reasonable comment? Oh, absolutely. I 100% agree. Um, movement is really complex. And I think we the best way that we can achieve, because there's so many things that if you think of like a clinician trying to incorporate all these, um, you know, concepts, and it's, it's mm. quite overwhelming, right? So I guess the best way of approaching this um, is just thinking about the demands that whatever it is you think of the movement or rehab movement or sports, right? You just think about the demands that that sport will uh, require and try to rehab in all those possible, for example, range of motions and thinking like not just the active, um, structures but also the passive structures and also like the the, the, the interaction between them so um, we need velocity we need uh, coordination um, we need power we need strength we need all these different features to actually move the mo in the most efficient way yeah? particularly mm. after pain yeah before we move on to the next topic one other thing i wanted to discuss with regards to looking at emg in the sensory motor system is when I think back to, say, the 2000s, there seemed to be a very big movement about this idea of motor control 
of using internal cues to quote unquote turn on a muscle. And, you know, there's a whole debate and discussion that can be happened about that. But you're obviously in the trenches with a lot of the researchers who started with this research. Have you seen that there's still a real emphasis on using types of cueing to try and change EMG behavior? Or do you see that it's really evolved more to include a lot of different variables as beyond that? I think it, I think, sorry, I think has been evolving definitely towards like incorporating the other um, factors as well. Um, EMG is like, as I said, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And um, I think everyone understands now that motor control is just more, is, is not just about the muscle. Um, and I do see that there is like a shifting towards like, um, like how we can better understand the whole system, but also like trying to identify like the pieces that, you know, are relevant. So that doesn't mean that we are like saying that this, that doesn't, you know, matter or like that, that, that moving doesn't matter. It's just understanding how and how much matters, right? Like, uh, um, we, 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 it's not just about like whether you, you activate or not activate a muscle, it's like how you do it. Like, is that different from what you do typically in your um, daily life? Like um, how much you do it? Like it, it, there's so many other factors that can contribute to that. So yeah, definitely moving towards more like a function, not a function, I want to say function, I hate that word. Um, <laughs> more like a- uh, <laughs> It's a very loaded term, yeah. <laughs> it's such a loaded term, like, you know, um, no one knows what that means. Um, <laughs> but more like, you know, understanding like holistic, I guess. Probably. Speaking of loaded terms, <laughs> well, no, the other one that I feel like gets thrown around a lot to mean lots of different things is activation. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've just mentioned that then. And yes. the reality is I think most physiotherapists think of activation as a muscle turning on. That, that to me seems very counterintuitive because it feels like if muscles were turning off in the presence of pain, we wouldn't have got very far through the evolution of, of humans living in, a, in the natural world. So, yeah. For you as a researcher, what, how do you define activation? How do you think we need to think about it clinically? So we, we actually have a nice um, terminology paper from this consensus project, and we have to define muscle activation. We, there were so many, many people that opposed to that, but just because for the you know, clinical world. But when we talk about muscle activation, we're mostly talking about the, EMG, the amplitude of the EMG signal right um but that that doesn't mean that the muscle activation term is the correct one because you're not actually measuring that you're measuring like the electrical input from the electrodes so it's not muscle activation really like that we can't really estimate that as a whole as you said mm. like it's just such a vague concept um but when we talk about like in research when people i think talk about muscle activation they're actually referring to the emg amplitude of the um the amplitude of the emg signal Yes. Yeah, and I think that's actually really worth emphasizing because it's obviously a term that's used in a research setting. Mm -hmm. And unless you actually have EMG analysis, which you know, most of us don't clinically, I think it's something that I, I do get concerned that whether there are certain connotations associated with that term and how that even is affects patients you work with when you're using that terminology as well. Yeah. Like, for it's, example, let's let's activate this muscle. Like, you need to do this um, warm-up to activate whatever muscle. The muscle is going to be acting, you know, mm. uh, functioning regardless of whatever you do. Um, so I agree. I think it's not well used in the clinical setting. Is there any evidence along the lines of some sort of activation that it does improve the performance? Or are, are those activities such as... Uh, you know, that people use in warm-ups that they say they, they call them often activation exercises, mm -hmm. but are they potentially even more related to say, the peripheral environment, like increases in the temperature of the tissue and, mm -hmm. you know, some of those enzymatic pathways do start to open once you actually start using that tissue specifically. Um, is there anything that suggests that activities that have high EMG activation patterns as per measured by EMG, um, do actually lead to better performance of that tissue um, and then consequently that tissue within the, a more complex motor task. Mm. Um, because that's the thing that I always think is interesting is there'll be a lot of these isolatory type activation exercises, but is that actually translating to better performance in say a running task or a change of direction? Um, I don't know, at least in my understanding, that that, that, that that leap has actually occurred. Not that I'm aware of. No, I agree. I don't think there's any anything like that um, is very tricky. The only thing that I can think of is, um, it was a nice study done a couple of years ago, I think, um, looking more like it, the plyometric 
exercises. So there's a uh, very simple task like jumping with a rope for I think it was 10 minutes with bouts of like I think it was like 40 seconds on, 20 seconds off for 10 minutes, and that definitely improved running um, performance. So I guess it's more about like um, for me to improve. Like it's such a, again, it's so different to study <laughs> mm. to investigate. But um, it depends on your previous level of like, you know, um, exercise, whether you've you've had those type of exercises before. But if someone that hasn't done any sort of biometric exercise and you're asking them to perform a activity which will require some sort of power, right, um, or speed, um, I think it's more beneficial to do some um, shortening and, 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 and um, lengthening of, of the key muscles. So again thinking more like it's a whole thing rather than very specific like activating the glutes medius because that will allow mm. you to decrease the pelvic drop when you're like in the stand space of running i don't think that's the case i don't think yeah no and i think like probably the more important thing is when you think of specificity think of specificity to task yeah. absolutely you know as opposed to like the idea of an individual muscle that's involved in that task absolutely yes yeah. i agree mm. now You've certainly done some interesting research in a few different areas. And one of the articles uh, that you, you've done that came to my attention was looking at changes in the stiffness properties of the Achilles tendon and the soleus with changes in knee angle. Mm. Now, this seems counterintuitive at first because when you think about the soleus, it only crosses the ankle, not the knee. So you wouldn't yeah. expect to see changes in its stiffness when you when you extend the knee as an example mm. yet in fact some of your the research you're involved in found that can you explain why that's the case yeah absolutely so just before this study was led by carlos cruz montesinos who's a researcher from chile so he kindly invited me to um, this research and we published this in 2022 in the journal of electromyography and kinesiology and basically we wanted to investigate um, like the influence, as you said, the knee and ankle joint positioning on the compressive stiffness of the soleus and Achilles tendon using a technique that's called um, myometry, which is a non-invasive and, and it gives you a surrogate measure of stiffness, which is also very important. Like we can't really measure stiffness in vivo at the moment, um, like directly. And what the study showed was that um, both the Achilles tendon and the soleus are sh showed significant increases in, in the compressive stiffness with knee extension compared to knee flexion across all the ankle positions that were tested. So we tested um, 10 degrees of, of dorsiflexion, the neutral, which is considered 90 degrees, and, and 10 degrees of, of um, sorry, plantar flexion, neutral, and 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. And um, these changes in stiffness were related with the knee positioning and were more pronounced in the soleus and the Achilles tendon. So especially when the ankle was in a neutral position or dorsiflexion. So as part of that study, they also conducted a um, cadaveric dissection to provide additional insight into what could be the explanation for these. Like as you said, the soleus doesn't cross the, the knee, just the ankle. So how can you see differences in stiffness when you move the knee? Um, so this kind of very dissection provided, it was really interesting because you can see the close anatomical relationship and potential paths for myofascial force transmission um, between the soleus, the gastric nemis and the Achilles tendon, suggesting that the, their anatomical basis for the this observed changes in its stiffness that we saw um, with the changes in the knee and ankle positioning. So the fascia is a really, like one of the big, um, like the main function of the fascia is to transmit forces. So that that's something that we typically forget. And um, when we think about forces, we're only thinking about muscle and tendon, but the fascia has a, has a, has a really important role in transmitting forces as well. Mm -hmm. What implications does that have do you, in the real world when you think from a, like from a, performance or rehabilitation setting because like when I think about anatomy we typically see it in a very uh re reductionistic fashion where we have mm -hmm. muscles we have this clear origin and insertion but that this throws it completely out of the water where <laughs> the reality is there is a lot of anatomical connections between synergistic muscles that then allow lateral force transmission and potentially longitudinal force transmission so how do you think that how do we need to think about how that influences what we do clinically? That's a really good question. I think it comes back to what you said before. Like we need to think about like the demands of, of the task that we want to rehab um, and not think about like the isolated muscle, but we also need to think like the interconnection between these tissues. So if fascia 
will contribute to transmitting forces. We need to think about like, of course, getting the strength and the power, but also that plyometric will affect the interaction between the muscle tendon and the fascia. So I, when I think about like this anatom like all these anatomical factors, I always try to think, okay, how can I provide the most variable? You, know, you need to provide variability because that's how you train all these different, because the fascia is also has different um, um, directions. So it, it's not just, you know, linear, as you said, or like vertical. So we, we need to understand that the, the, the ability to produce force will also depend on the direction on which you apply that force. So uh, I try to think of like in a practical, practical way, um, how I can translate this into practice is, uh, well, you need to give variability and try to um, think of like all the different physical capacities or abilities that you need to train and not just, you know, the activation. So it's not about <laughs> just, you know, whether you move nicely, it's also about like actually getting that person to produce force, like in a, in a, in a good way, power, um, and all sort of like the different um, physical demands that that person might need. Yeah. It's an interesting concept. You just made me think of the fact that adding variability is likely to improve, say, robustness of a tissue to the external stresses and ergonomic tasks that you undertake. However, we, we live in a world now where everyone's trying to measure improvement, say, particularly through a rehabilitation or performance setting. And the more variability you add, the less likely you are to see, say, linear changes in someone's performance capability. So you're almost disincentivized <laughs> to do more variable things, even though it probably prepares them for the task at hand, especially in, say, like a multilateral sport or something like that. So, yeah, that, I guess it's a statement, but uh, it, you just made me think of that, that adding that variability is extremely important, yet it may not come up on some of our measures as being oh, they've improved their power output in, say, a sagittal plane task. Yeah, I think, again, it comes back to what you want to achieve, like for what purpose you're adding that variability. So that variability wouldn't, wouldn't be random, right? It would be like mm. targeted to that specific movement. So um, I think we often forget like that the person needs to go back to the natural, the normal environment and the rehab, at least from what I've seen, is typically like in the kind of first phase of like we have like the that the force is a equal you know isometric force like whatever all these tests that we do but it's actually the person like performing at the pre-injury levels mm. uh, that's a different story in rehab uh, and prehab as well because you also want to try to avoid like um, recurrence of injury so i guess my comment was more about like we need to think about the movement as a whole and what the person needs to do rather than like just you know rehab like that muscle that specific you know task or whatever um and i think adding and again this is not this is more like my personal opinion i don't think we have evidence for this but i'm not sure if like adding variability will, will um um decrease performance in the end like I'm not no, sure. No, I, I don't think it would. Well, no, yeah. I think it's probably more reflective of decreased performance in like a, a measure such as doing like a single leg, a seated calf raise as yeah, an example. Yeah, isometric, you know, force plate yeah. task or something like that, which is unfortunately for us, we want these measures because yeah. it creates this idea of certainty around, say, return to play or something. 100%. But that might not actually be a nice correlate for them being ready as opposed no. to, as you said, exposure to different variations of that task yes. you know uh, that might actually be a better preparation but we can't measure those things in a quantitative fashion in the same mm. way so we kind of lean on those tasks that we can measure but maybe that's not actually getting what you want no, and the other thing i think of too then like you mentioned too before manuela is when you think of fascia which the reality is when we have a strain we often affect the fascial tissue as well yeah. there are different layers that go in different directions and so if you're applying say a seated calf raise as an example for the soleus, it's obviously applying forces in one particular direction. Mm -hmm. When it comes to running on the field, there's a, there's a lot of non-linearity in terms of the angles and the positions of the ankle and the body and how that loads the, not only the soleus, but then the surrounding connective tissue as well. So the, the importance of that variability to be able to apply forces in different directions seems really important to make sure that you're actually maximizing the tissue properties I agree. I think mm. we need to, that's the key thing, maximizing the, key, the tissue properties based on, on the task demand, like the demands of, of that person, whatever that might be. Um, and going back to your comment of like, how do we measure it? I think 
yeah, I think we need those uh, specific tasks to be able to, um, you know, progress in our rehab. And but there are also like other things that we can measure, like like if the person was like running a certain time of, or pace or, or um, whatever or doing whatever distance, like all those like general things. If you think of like, okay, if the person is doing sort of the same sort of um, activities that they were doing pre-injury and also the confidence, like more like the psych measures that, that, that we could incorporate in our rehab, like do they feel like um, with enough confidence to, to, to actually be able to perform at that pre injury level so i think that would be like um a way of, that I, at least i would do it um but i agree it's really hard to measure like you can incorporate all these different things yeah. changing topic a little bit but nevertheless yeah. very interesting you were involved in a, a research publication recently looking at the relationship between sleep and recovery and yeah. this is an interesting topic because I think a lot of the time people will offhandly say, oh, like sleep is really important, diet's really important. But this is a study that really looked at, um, at, at different physiological measures of mm -hmm. what happens when you induce an injury and, and deprive, this is an animal model, um, them of sleep. Can you actually explain the study and what you actually did and what you actually found? Yeah, absolutely. So again, the, I was kindly invited to be part of this project and the, the um, the Don't be too modest. <laughs> <laughs> it was all you. You came up with this, the idea. No, you read the just in the room here. Yeah. No, no, you no. You self-funded it, everything. <laughs> so the person who led this uh, project is actually um, a NHMRC emergency, emerging leadership fellow at UQ, so David Klein. He's He's been conducting amazing work around like the uh, interplay between sleep, exercise, and pain, particularly the transition between acute to chronic pain. And also now we're investigating the fluctuation of pain. So this project that I'm currently working on, the Low Back Pain Flares, is um, one of the principal investigators. So in this study that you're talking about, as you said, we used um, um, a rat model to investigate um, whether poor sleep contributes to the persistence of pain and whether exercise can mitigate that this transition, exploring like the underlying biological mechanisms that could be involved. So the study um, involved 29 uh, rats <laughs> that were subjected to an intensive lever pulling task for uh, about four weeks to simulate this acute onset um, of overuse injury. So after the injury, the rats were divided into three groups for another four weeks. So the first group was voluntary exercise via a running wheel axis. The second group was the sleep disturbance. And the third group was a combination of both. So we um, measured like a bunch of different outcome measures. So pain related behaviors, um, systemic levels of, for example, the brain derived neurotrophic factor, the BDN. F, which is basically a measure of central sensitization and maladaptive neuroplasticity, which in in um, turn could drive the uh, transition from acute to chronic pain. And we also measure other um, biological markers like estradiol and cortisone, all those type of things. And um, what we found was that after the injury, the mechanical sensitivity increased across all groups, but remained elevated only with the sleep disturbance group. And exercise with or without um, sleep, regardless of the sleep disturbance, um, were reduced the sensitivity to the pre-injury level. So that's that's pretty interesting and cool. Mm -hmm. And also the um, reflexive um, grip strength, which is also like a way of 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 confirming that the rats had an injury, an overuse injury, also declined post-injury, which we would expect, but improved post-intervention, especially in the um in the exercise group. And the final thing is that BDNF, this sensitiza central sensitization marker, also um, increased with the sleep disturbance alone, but were normalized with exercise. So what this study tells us is that um, it actually provides like the first evidence to that poor sleep could be um, may play like a causal role in the transition from acute to chronic pain by possibly enhancing these peripheral and or central sensitization mechanisms. And, and basically um, what we also um, can take off out of the study is that exercise has a really big important role um, or, a, or, or a potential intervention to counteract the effects of, of poor sleep on pain sensitivity. So basically by potentially reducing desensitization, exercise offers like this 
um, non-pharmacological -pharm option to mitigate the persistence of pain after injury. So lots of cool things. And, and now we're trying to um, investigate this in, in humans. So that's the next step. Is us. there been consideration to the type of exercise, like whether it's more aerobic in nature or say, <laughs> you know, you know, a lifting task or something like that that's more anaerobic in nature? Does that, does that seem to have an effect? Do you know? Yeah, so that's a really, it's important point. So this was an aerobic exercise and that we do think that aerobic will have like a greater impact than, than like a strengthening base, but we don't know yet. So um, it's hard for, for rats to do a, like an anaerobic exercise. So the, the only exercise that we can do is just the, um, running wheel. on the wheel. Yeah. Well, yeah. you could you could have a resisted wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's a good. That could be a good the, model. No, the re can I ask why you believe it might be more beneficial to do aerobic? What is there certain mechanisms that give you that inclination? Yeah, we don't know yet. Like that's a really good point. We don't know the the because we know that the exercise is mediating this path, right? But we don't really know like inside what what actually doing we, we believe that it's affecting the bd bdnf right like in in the long term but how it does it like which by which mechanism the aerobic exercise does that like we we don't know so it could be that other type of exercises um will will have an impact we we're hoping to have more answers to that after this big project that we're currently running in humans <laughs> the thing i took from the study that was really valuable is this relationship between local tissue damage and systemic markers mm. because i think you know obviously is a, a general recommendation all the time when you have say acute low back pain it's recommended to continue to do some form of physical exercise or activity and i think it's something that a lot of people both clinicians and patients don't appreciate of trying to maximize systemic health through being physically active, through maintaining good sleep hygiene and quality, because how that influences your physiology actually has an impact on the local tissue environment and the recovery process. Yeah, absolutely. I think the sleep is a big beast as well. Like we often, we know that we should sleep well, but we actually don't do anything about it. Like, no. like even like I, I, I know all this research and I, I go, go to bed with my computer, I watch Netflix, like, you know, connect to my phone, I, I do all these like awful routines that you shouldn't do. Um, but I think that's a really cool thing that we know that sleep could affect sensitization via these biological markers, right? So it, and then ac physical activity is actually counteracting this effect by affecting or um, probably improving uh, or, or managing the the um, increase of the spike of the biological markers, so mm. and therefore will have an effect in central sensitization. So, I think the combination of both for like clinicians is so important. Like first, detect if if there are sleep issues like sleep impairment or sleep disturbance. So whether you're sleeping bad, but also the effect of sleep on the next day, so your quality and how you're performing, and and knowing that exercise even like the smallest bit of exercise could probably um have a positive effect on mm. on on your um the bad effect that sleep has on your system in your system when you're well, in pain it, it makes a lot of sense too when you think about the prevalence of low back pain and particularly long-term low back pain is getting worse and worse most pain seems to be very non-specific in nature yet mm -hmm. we see it still seem to apply a purely very mechanical lens to looking at back pain in terms of like biomechanics and strength which not to say that they aren't relevant markers they are but it seems that there's so much more research suggesting that other indicators of your overall systemic health and sleep and exercise are good examples seem to have such a strong correlation to the outcome of back pain as well and it seems that like back pain can almost be an indicator for a lot of people of chronic disease you know similar to things like cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes i mean that's just my opinion I, you might disagree with that but it just seems to be that we need to be a lot more holistic when we think about overall general health markers of individuals who present with non-specific low back pain yeah i agree and i think what we're trying to do now is trying to understand what treatment fits the right person i think we're not there yet so it might be that movement related things are more like beneficial for some specific people and more like suck measures to other people and maybe sleep and other behavioral stuff other, like we i think we're moving towards like finding the right treatment for the right person in the right doses at the right time which is really hard but i think that that's where we're moving now um mm. but 
by all means, doing general things that we all know that works for like general population, like sleep, physical activity, nutrition, you know, do do the basic right. I think that will, you know, cover probably the 80% of, of your rehab plan if you do the, the basic right and then try to um, manage the specifics. That would be my, that's my personal it, opinion. It, it sounds like we need to get better than understanding human psychology and behavior <laughs> because, you know, they're often the, the biggest barriers to actually seeing improvements in a lot of these types of patients to create those behavioral lifestyle changes. Absolutely. What's next on the horizon for you? Are you involved in any other research topics in completely different areas of what we discussed today? Um, so besides what we just, uh, what I just said about like low back pain flares, flares which is pretty novel as well, because one thing is the transition between acute to chronic, but we don't really know what makes someone worse when they already have low back pain. So we are investigating that at the moment. It's a pretty big, like a five year project. So we probably won't hear much about it like in the next few years, but hopefully like after that. Um, besides that, and we're also like playing very cool measures in the real world, like measuring like sleep quality with um, um, pretty cool equipment and movement and um, we're doing like blood collection and saliva for cortisol, so, like all these different measures that hopefully will give us a better idea um, of this holistic um, problem. And, and Besides that, I also, we're running a couple of studies in running, <laughs> running and running, um, looking at self-regulation strategies in, in running injuries. So we're currently recruiting people, uh, runners with and without injuries that, that self-classify themselves as injury prone or injury resistant. So I'm very passionate about like, we, all, we always study um, why people get injured, but we don't really study why people don't get injured, right? Or, mm. or what makes someone, um, you know, be so robust? Know, exactly, yeah. robust. That's the word. Yes. I, I think that. Sorry, I'm jumping it's in, okay. but uh, like, I don't know if Jack shared this with you, but I, I coach track and field at a high level, and one of the big things that I get really frustrated with is there's a, a huge um, concept of people getting excited by people with talent, but often a lot of these talent, talented people have a lot of injuries. Right. And they always talk about the fact that, oh, they're so talented if they could only get their body right. Yes. And I often bring up the exact thing that you just said. Maybe some people's talent is not that they can perform at a really high level, but they're so robust that they can train their way to that level. And we don't see that robustness is in itself their, their inherent talent. And studying those people, I think that you've touched on something and I probably haven't shared this with people, but I actually think that there is a really strong association between psychological factors and the way that they view what they're doing and what they're trying to achieve and getting injured. Yes. Um, you know, like uh, with some of my athletes, for instance, if I say to them, we're going into a heavy training period um, where the, you know, the volume or the intensity or both are going to be a little bit higher than normal, some people will see that as the perfect opportunity to improve. And some will see that as the perfect opportunity to start complaining that they're tired and sore and oh, I've just got to get through this and I don't know if I'm going to cope. And straight away, those people are very quick to start reporting, oh, this is sore, this is tight. And I think, have you actually self, you know, perpetuated this situation because the way that you came into it was one in which you were scared? Um, so yeah, I apologize for jumping in, but uh, I think okay. that you're very much hitting on something that I think is there, that there are people who don't get injured because they almost don't even conceptualize the idea that they can get injured. They're not considering it as an option. Whereas mm -hmm. people who have been injured see that it, there's danger at every single turn. And it, to me, at least it does seem like it contributes to them developing injuries in the first yeah. place. I 100% I agree. I think it's a, it's fascinating, at, at least to me. I think we, we need to study more of those um, robust people. And there are a couple of things like mental toughness and passion. Uh, as, you, as you said, like a psych and behavioral factors that could I think contribute um, greatly to whether someone's experiencing an injury. And, and it's so hard because the, the pain is a perception, but also you have like tissue loading, like the actual you know, mm, mechanical damage, load, yeah. mechanical loading, and also all these fears and things like will affect that perception. So it's it's really hard to understand. So I, I think 
like if we study people that don't get injured like or at least haven't had an injury in the past year or two versus who has someone who has like at least one or two injuries in the past year like recurrent versus injury resistant like if we can call it them like that and we study like what are the key features of that like what 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 these people do to actually be injury free like what are the strategies and and i think this self-regulation strategies coping all these psych um things that that person could incorporate will make a huge difference so we're doing this mixed method studies a quantitative survey looking at all these psychological factors but also we'll be interviewing people to further understand what they do how they do it what they think this is important or not you know so um if you don't mind we'd be happy to share the once we start the study with your team yeah. that would be great to have um yeah I, I always i always think about it of like some you, you present because it's interesting often i'll present the exact same information to two different people and these are adults but you see very clearly one sees this as an opportunity one sees this as a risk yeah. and the way you have to actually manage their expectations and how they get through that period is is so different and it can be very frustrating because you're saying like your teammate who you're at a similar level to in terms of performance is seeing this as a great opportunity to to, to get better and this one you're seeing is like i'm so scared that something's going to go wrong and yeah. it seems to self-perpetuate um so that's so I, interesting I do, yeah I, I, I think it's a big factor that you and it's I'm, it's really cool that you guys are exploring this because i think it's going to show some very interesting uh you know new information that's cool you make me think that we should probably interview coaches as well because they will have like a whole different perspective on what's going on with that you know um, so we might incorporate that as well because we're only looking at from the runner's perspective. Um, but it'd be also cool to see what coaches think is happening. Mm. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Manuela. Um, you, you've mentioned that you do research in lots of different fields. Outside of your professional work, do you have any other particular interests or passions that you're pursuing at the moment? Well, I'm a very passionate runner myself. That's why I research on that area and I'm currently... Um, training for um, the Gasser, which is an ultra trail uh, race here in Brisbane, um, the 50k. I was, I'm a new mum, so m my daughter has like less than a year. So it's a very big challenge for me to try to train and push my limits while also keeping the expectations low because <clears throat> my fitness level before being a mum was like here. And now I'm like, I can't even like show you where am I, but um. <laughs> So that's that's what I'm currently working on from a personal level. Yeah. Yeah. You, sh you should take confidence from uh, Australia's super mums that are doing really well in the marathon. Mm. We've got we've got yeah. two, we've got four of them that I think are mothers that are probably our, our top four, three, four, five um, marathon runners. So yes. uh, yeah, don't don't be scared. I think the performance seems to they seem to be getting better and better, and they, and some of them are well into their forties. So I yeah. know I've seen that, and I think you know what I think is like. Being a mom exposed you or like the the whole experience exposed you to like so many things that I think you can push yourself and tolerate yes. more pain, mm -hmm. um, way more now than before. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a concept that you know Jack and I have been discussing a little bit recently. But I, I think it's anything that introduces you to new stressors. You know, and some of them are psychological, some emotional, some physical you know, sleep deprivation, all of these things, mm -hmm. as you said, expands your envelope to be able to deal with, you know, problems that are in front of you. So all of a sudden you see something like a 20K run as, as a training run as a much smaller problem than what it was, you know, pre, <laughs> pre child. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's easy. I'd rather deal with well, that than that. sleepless nights. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I, I do think that it really expands what you believe you're capable of. And that in itself is a huge strength that you gain from parenthood in general. Mm. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for giving up some of your time to come on and talk to us about all the really interesting and diverse things that you're doing in the research world. Thank you, Jack. And I'm sorry that I called you James. <laughs> no, it's good. From now on, I'm going to be calling him James as well. And he's going to hate it. So thank you, Manuela. Um, you've, given, so you've given me years of ammunition now. <laughs> Oh, I'll no, never hear so the end of coming. it now. Never yeah. hear the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Um, no, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed this um, conversation. I hope it was, was helpful. <laughs> no, thank oh, you. Definitely.